we can return to the book of Jeremiah. We did have one more prayer request. Pastor said she forgot to make mention of her mother wasn't doing very well. Request a prayer for her. Right. Jeremiah chapter number four. At this point, the uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been taken into bondage. And Jeremiah was in the middle of that, and he says in verse number 3 of Jeremiah chapter 4, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. I'd like us to think upon this, breaking up our fallow ground. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this time we have to hear from thy word. I pray to you bless the preaching of your word. I thank you for the Sunday school lesson, Lord. I pray to you the afternoon class as well. Do pray for Brother Larry as he's out sick. You might heal him up. Pray, Lord, that you might cause us here to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Help us be busy about the work you've called us to do. Well, I thank you for your goodness and faithfulness towards us in Christ and his sacrifice. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, here, Jeremiah, really the Lord through Jeremiah, says, break up your fallow ground and sown out among thorns. The fallow ground is that ground which has been left bare, it's been untilled. If you leave it fallow long enough, it begins to grow up into thorns. And I think about our place when we bought it, the field behind us had been left bare for I don't know how many years and there was Thorns and briar bushes at least six foot tall. I'm going to have the one who bush shot the first time. But it had been left foul and had grown up. It wasn't really useful for anything. So, do we have a lot of fallow ground in our life? I'd say yeah. most of us probably do. Yeah. That was the message to the people of God then and really it still applies to us today. We need to break up that fallow ground, that ground that we've left sit bare, left until left unplanted. Oh, yeah. so it wouldn't do much, shouldn't do much good to go and throw your seeds out on the fallow ground. All right. When that uh, field was all grown up there in my house, I, it wouldn't have done much good to go out and throw the seeds in among the briars and the thorn bushes. Well, maybe our fellow ground is prayer, or maybe it's study, maybe it's witnessing, maybe it's our music or something else we listen to, maybe it's something else entirely. But I'd say all of us have this fellow ground that needs to be broke up, that needs to be tended to. Break up your fellow ground, he says. It takes work to break up the fellow ground, doesn't it? Yeah. Just the same, it'll take work to break up that spiritual pile of ground as well. Mm. So on the other end of it, you can you can keep plowing the same row over and over again. But that does you eventually wear out the ground, don't you? Mm -hmm. There's an argument to be made that this hasn't always been the case, but nowadays you you know you don't want to plant the same thing again, over and over again. You know, they like to rotate corn, so it means and so on. So the earth can replenish the nutrients. We need to do the same thing, but only sometimes they even leave the field empty for a year. Then we need to break up that fallow ground after it's laid empty. Yeah. Well, like I said, it'll take work to break up the fallow ground. It won't be just, well, I'm going to go over here and start sowing. So that. That field I mentioned at my house, it was it was broke up before and then it was just left empty. 
Normally the pellet passed away before he was able to plant anything. So now it's like this out through there. So it won't do any good just to break it up and not sow it either. So one, one example I found in the scriptures of the fallow ground that needs to be broke up in Israel and in Judah was the high places. Now if you're familiar with the high places, there were two types. One was built to the idols and there were some that were built to Jehovah. Before the temple was built, people used the high places to sacrifice. But over in, I think it's Deuteronomy, we're told to tear down those high places and said to go sacrifice in the place which he had appointed, which would be Jerusalem. Then when you get to the divided kingdom, Jeroboam would set up high places in the northern kingdom. Rehoboam would allow high places to be set up in the southern kingdom. You can find that in 1 Kings 12 and 1 Kings 14. It said Deuteronomy 12 was where they're told to worship in Jerusalem. Though. Well, the high places are an example of you can be doing the right thing the wrong way, aren't they? So they were making sacrifices to God. They weren't doing it the way he told them to do it. Just the same, we can be doing what we perceive as the service of God and not be doing it the way God told us we ought to do it. What they need to do is tear down those high places and do it God's way. Yeah. Well, I, we don't have this problem necessarily, but many so-called churches do. They want to bring in men by some other way other than the preaching of the gospel. Yes. Entertainment, whatever it may be. That's really no different than the high places. They may think they're doing a service to God, but they're not doing it the way God instructed us to do it. Yeah. Let's go over to 1 Kings for a moment. 1 Kings chapter 15. First Kings 15 verses 11 through 14. We have here Asa. Asa was a good king, especially compared to some of his predecessors. Eight, uh, First Kings 15 verse 11. It says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did, did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land, and he ruined all the idols that his father had made. And also, Maacha his mother, even her he removed from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kidron. And those verse 14. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect in the Lord all his days. If you go over to the First Chronicles, it tells us that he did tear down the high places of the idols. But he didn't remove the high places which the people were offering unto Jehovah. So you can be doing lots of things right and still have fellow ground needs to be broke up, can't you? So you might be a, seen as a great person in the eyes of the people, but yet even Asa and all that which was right which he did, yet he still had one area which he should have broke up that he left the high places in intact. Like I said, we oftentimes do the same type of things, don't we? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, they're there. Those people aren't bothering nothing, so I'll just leave them alone. Yet we ought to really take a stand for God, shouldn't we? For doing things the right way. Right. You know, as I mentioned in the fallow ground, if you keep plowing and plowing, it, might end up in the dust bowl like they did back in the 30s. Yeah. They, if you're not familiar, they plowed the ground so much out west that when the wind blew, it just blew dust everywhere. A miserable place to live in from what I've read of it. 
So what we'll have we got? Not just keep plowing the same old row over and over again. We need to get over to the fallow ground sometimes and break it up. Yeah. So I don't think it's any coincidence that you have the quote unquote roaring 20s and then followed by the depression and the dust bowl of the 30s. Uh -huh. so the rise of the, the flappers, the rise of Margaret Sanger, among other things, happened in the 20s. Yeah. And a lot of modern that the flappers were, they were considered rebellious and ungodly in their time. They'd probably be welcomed as modest and chaste in the modern church, though. Yeah, we've left the ground fellow in that area, haven't we? Yeah. Now the thorns have grown up there. That's just one example. Well, I won't read all these examples I have listed here, but... Asa's son, Jehoshaphat, it said of him that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet he removed not the high places. That's in chapter 22. You go in four kings later to the Jehoash in 2 Kings chapter 12. He, it says, Did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet he removed not the high places. Jehoash's son, Amaziah, in chapter 14 of 2 Kings, it said the, the same thing. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet the high places were not removed. Go on again to Amaziah, his son, or so Azariah, also known as Uzziah in the book of Isaiah. It said the same thing of him. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet the high places were not removed. Then you go once again to his son, Jotham. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet the high places were not removed. All these people, all these kings, they were doing good things. But yet they still had that one area that should have been broke up. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, by and large, most of us are doing a lot of good things, aren't we? But we, there you go. we got that one area that needs to be broke up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just we kind of left to ignore, left to grow up to the thorns. Finally, it was Hezekiah, who was the grandson of Joseph. In 2 Kings chapter 18, let's turn there. Somewhere around 200 years after Rehoboam, Hezekiah comes along. Second <coughs> Kings chapter 18, first five verses says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother named his mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. And he trusted in the Lord of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that was before him. He said, somewhere around 200 years later, finally Hezekiah breaks up the fallow ground, tears down those high places. Yeah. Does it do the same thing happen with us as people of God? I'd say probably so. Hundreds of years could have passed. I mean, it's been almost 100 years since the 20s. Just a couple more years away, and we left that ground fallow for that long. It almost doesn't seem like that should be possible with people of God, but yet we're no different with than Israelites, are we? We do a lot. We do a lot of the same things they do. You know what happened when Hezekiah finally broke up the fallow ground? No stuff actually happened. If you go and. Verse 7, it says, And the Lord was with him, and he prospered there, so he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. He smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the pent city. Wait. 
It was in here in the king for the reign of Hezekiah that the northern kingdom would be dragged off to bondage. That same empire would come up against Hezekiah and the kingdom of Judah, and yet they would not be taken away. When we break up the foul ground, we should expect something to happen, shouldn't we? We shouldn't expect much when we're just plowing the same old row over and over again. Or when we would actually get in there and like I said, break up that foul ground, we might actually see a move of God for a change. Mm -hmm. No, Hezekiah, that's exactly what he did when we saw it happen to him. But as it says of him, there was none like him before him, none after him. The Lord was with him, he says. He prospered with us wherever he went. So we're just satisfied with routine though, aren't we? I see it not just here and everywhere I went and preached just about it. It's the same old routine over and over again. Oh, how we ought to get busy about breaking up the ground that we've let lay bare. We let the thorns grow up and you know, for the northern kingdom, it was never said of any of their kings that they did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. I couldn't not. And, but yet they were rooting up the high places. Well, they, I believe it was all the way after they were carried away into bondage, the high places were still there. It would be Josiah, king of Judah, the north of the southern kingdom. He was the great grandson of Hezekiah. He would go up and tear down the high places in Samaria, the northern kingdom. That was another 250, 300 years after they were originally set up. Let's go over to 2 Kings 23. I'm not going to read all this. You can read the first 25 verses of the chapter. And it tells all of what Josiah did. He cleared house, so to speak. He came in, he took out all the idols, all the false priests, all the false prophets. He went and burned them and stamped them down as powder, it says in one spot. And he took the Sodomites and break their houses up and said he, he said he came in and he really went to town, if you will. I believe it's up, I forget where, in the chapter here. But it says he went up to Samaria and tore down their high places as well. Stuff happened in the years in the reign of Josiah too. Go over to verse uh, 21. And the king, speaking of Josiah, commanded all the people saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God as is written in the book of this covenant. Apparently they had got so in their routines that they weren't even keeping the Passover anymore. If they were, they weren't doing it correctly. It says, Surely there was not holding such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel nor in all the days of the kings of Israel nor of the kings of Judah. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover was sold to the Lord in Jerusalem. So he went to business, like I said, and there was a Passover greater than any other that had ever been in the land of Israel. So when he broke up the battle ground, there was something happened. There was a move of God, if you will. We can't expect a move of God when we do the same thing over and over again. Well, I don't, I don't like quoting Einstein too much because he wasn't exactly a godly man, but I think he did say something like the definition of stupidity to do the same thing over and over again expect the same results or expect different results. <laughs> but we, we oftentimes do the same thing, don't we? Mm -hmm. We come in, we meet, we sing a few songs, we hear from preaching, hear some teaching, we go home and nothing's really different, is it? Yeah. I'm not saying anything necessarily wrong with all of that. But we can do the right things the wrong way, all of a sudden. 
We're not worshiping in spirit and truth. We're not worshiping God to begin with. So we're not coming together with the desire to hear from God in His Word, then you won't, shouldn't expect to hear from God in His Word. Oh, how we ought to get busy about breaking up the fellow ground. Well, the second part of that verse said, and so not among thorn, back in our text. <coughs> that ought to seem like common sense, you know? You don't want to sow your seed among the thorn. You know, oftentimes the scripture seems to say things that ought to be obvious, but yet it has to be pointed out to us. Yeah. So not among thorns. Like I mentioned, I wouldn't go out to that field of mine when I first bought it threw anything other than maybe some blackberry seeds out there and expected it to grow. <coughs> Certainly wouldn't have thrown some tomato seeds out there and expected them to grow up. But yet, we try to do the same thing, don't we? We want to sow among the thorns. We don't want to take the time and effort to actually break up the ground, clear the ground. But what are these thorns? I think we find it in Luke chapter 8. Actually, it's in... Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with a, we'll take Luke's account for this. Luke chapter 8, you see the parable of the sower. <coughs> I think most of us are familiar with this parable. You know, he says that some were sown by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured the seeds before they could grow. That some were sown on the rocks and they sprang up and had no root, so they withered away. Some were sown among the thorns in verse number 7. And the thorns sprang up and choked it. And then there were others that fell on good ground and they sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. Then he expounds the, he expounds the parable beginning in verse number 10. Verse 14 says, And they... And that which fell among thorns are they, which when they have heard, go forth, and, and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring forth no fruit to perfection. The thorns are the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Yet we try to sow and sow there all the time, don't we? Really, we got to get rid of the thorns before we can sow the seed. We can't, just as you wouldn't plant your garden in the briar patch, you wouldn't, we shouldn't plant our spiritual seeds in one of the thorns either. Yeah. Right. Yet oftentimes I think we try to do that, don't we? We try to sow spiritual things along with worldly things, and it just doesn't work out that way. So it's so not along the thorns. It ought to seem obvious. It, in the physical it does, but... I think in the spiritual, we try to do it all the time. So over in Galatians chapter 6, really another obvious statement from a physical viewpoint, but once again, we have to have it pointed out to us sometimes in a spiritual application. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I mean, that seems obvious, doesn't it? If you uh, plant apple trees, you get apples. You plant a tomato plant, you expect to get tomatoes, right? Not, you don't expect to get cucumbers. Yet, Paul has to point it out to us here that. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8 says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we shouldn't be surprised when we sow to the flesh and reap things of the flesh, should we? Yeah. But oftentimes we are, it seems like. Yeah. And I don't know why all this stuff's going wrong. We didn't sow the right in the right seed, did we? Yeah. So the fruits of the spirit are listed in the previous chapter, verses twenty-two through and twenty-three. 
It's evidence that we've been sowing spiritual seed if we have spiritual fruit, isn't it? If we see this, the works and the fruits of the flesh are listed previously, that means we must be in the sowing of the flesh, isn't it? Right. You know, Job said another very similar statement, or actually it wasn't Job, it was one of his friends in the book of Job. Chapter 4. Job 4 and verse 8. Eliphaz is speaking here, but he says something that's quite true. In verse 8 he says, Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness, reap the same. So if you plow in wickedness and you, or you plow in iniquity and sow wickedness, you can expect to reap the same thing. You can expect to reap the fruits of that. You know, when you sow spirit or sexual promiscuity, you can expect to reap the fruits of that. Yeah. I think we all know what some of those fruits are. They're not pleasant fruits, are they? Right. But when we sow to the spiritual things, we can expect to reap the spiritual things. That love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, weakness, temperance. <laughs> well, I don't know if y'all know what bane berries are. I don't know too many people that grow them for food, do They're poisonous to eat very many of them. I didn't know it, but there's a town over in East Tennessee that's named after them. It's called Bainberry, Tennessee. Because they had a lot of them grow there. But you don't go... Said you don't go out and grow bainberries for fruit because they're poisonous. Yet should we grow go out and grow corrupt and fleshly seeds because that's exactly what they're gonna lead to is corruption. They're spiritual poison to us. Yet we seem to sow those a lot now. No, let's go one more place here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Once again, it ought to seem an obvious statement to us. Second Corinthians 9, verse number 6. It says, With this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. You know what? When I was a kid, and my stepdad used to grow a big garden. Usually so much so that I'd sell some, we'd give away some, and still have too much we could eat. You wouldn't get that if you sold one little tomato plant, one little patch of cucumbers. So don't expect it. Just sow a little bit and reap a great harvest. I think that's that's the modern mindset, isn't it? Put in as little, as little effort as possible to get out the most benefits that you can. That's not the things works the way things work spiritually. There's work to sowing and reaping, isn't there? There's work to growing a garden or a farm, whatever it may be. But we want to put on put in as little work as possible and we expect the Lord to rain down blessings upon us as if we've done him a favor. Paul says no if you reap if you, uh, excuse me, sow sparingly, you're going to reap so sparingly. He said that ought to be an obvious statement as it is physically. You can't sow one or two stalks of corn and expect to have enough to feed all of Clarksville. But spiritually, we do the same thing. We just sow a little bit of seed over here. Okay, Lord, I've really done something for you. And when we get, we probably got a whole field that's been left fallow. Yeah. 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 Hosea preached the almost the same message break up the fallow ground. We turn there and we'll read that little close. 
Hosea chapter 10. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of the lives, because thou didst trust in thy way, and the multitude of thy mighty men. I think he was speaking to Israel here, the northern kingdom, and they had they said they had plowed wickedness, and they had reaped iniquity. They had reaped exactly what they sowed. This command to them was to sow righteousness. To break up the foul of ground. He said, seek the Lord till he comes. Well, that's the same for us today, isn't it? We need to break up the foul of ground and seek the Lord till he returns. Seek him. Really, we should still seek him, us that are saved. Seek, have fellowship with him. Seek have His presence with us. Seek for His Holy Spirit to fill us. We can still seek the Lord in that sense. And break up that fallow ground. Like say, you know, we can't expect blessings when we have one, little, one or two little plants growing and a bunch of fallow ground around us. We can't just throw a handful of seeds out there in that pile of ground and expect it to do anything. No, well, really, we need to get busy about doing what He's called us to do and doing it the way He told us to do it. Now let's close with that thought. We're